All right, let's get started. Uh, thank you so much for coming for this talk uh, in the afternoon. It's a cold day, and I have this uh, AC blowing air right on top of me. It's the only time I forgot my jacket, which I got from Seattle, but uh, I'm kind of repenting the fact I didn't get my jacket here. But Florida's going to be nice. Anyhow, uh, my name is Pranav Rastogi. I'm a program manager uh, at Microsoft. And my focus areas are around effectively making AI or machine learning sort of accessible to developers. And my historical sort of background has been a lot around uh, building uh, sort of web dev stacks around application development with .NET and ASP.NET. I did a lot of work with the, with the file new project. So when you get started with a new project, uh, any, any web project in, in, in Visual Studio, uh, that's, that's me. And then I sort of did a bunch of work with uh, uh, running sort of a few cloud services around uh, Predis Cache, web jobs, um, and then sort of explored my way into sort of big data for a couple of years where I was working quite heavily with the open source Apache ecosystem with, in terms of Hadoops and Spark and, and others. And uh, now sort of for the last few months I've been spending my time uh, ensuring that uh, developers are successful with machine learning. And this talk is going to focus specifically on uh, ML.NET which is a machine learning framework for .NET developers. Uh, this is about a 75 minute talk. Uh, so what I'll be covering in this talk is, uh, what is ML.NET? What kind of scenarios can you solve with ML.NET? I'll be sort of demoing you some examples of scenarios that you can uh, sort of uh, solve with ML.NET uh, as, as well. And before I begin sort of uh, in this audience, a raise of hands, how many people know ML.NET? Okay, so there are about you know one percent of the people know ML.NET. So I'll I'll keep it sort of at a level two hundred to three hundred where I'll introduce ML.NET so you folks know have an idea as to what the framework is, what the capabilities are, and I'll show you sort of code in terms of uh, how would you go about building these machine learning models, which will be at a level three hundred. Uh, does that work for everybody? Okay. And if you have any questions, uh, just raise your hand, and I'll try to answer questions as we go along. So I just want to make sure that you sort of have a get, an, get an idea in terms of what an ML dot, what ML.NET is in terms of a framework stack, and what kind of scenarios can you solve with ML.NET. So please do raise your hand if you have any questions as we go along the way. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, how many folks are .NET developers here? Oh, perfect. So then you kind of know the thing, and you know, historically we've had sort of great .NET story for building uh, applications focusing desktop, web, cloud, mobile, uh, uh, gaming with Unity. And now sort of what we're doing is, uh, given that machine learning is becoming very popular and sort of graduating from it being uh, you know, slightly immature to it being sort of somewhat real, we're also sort of making ensuring that you can run uh, you can do machine learning in .NET as well. And I'll sort of tell you the differences with ML.NET and how we sort of position ML.NET with other frameworks like TensorFlow and stuff so you get an idea as to when to use what uh, as well. So uh, what is uh, machine learning? How many folks know machine learning over here? Ah, oh, perfect. So machine learning at its heart is, uh, is basically programming the unprogrammable, which is basically, you know, given a problem, can you write a function to figure out how to solve the problem? So in this case, the problem is, is this picture a face or a not? And the machine learning part of this problem is around writing a function or a machine learning model that can sort of understand this image, uh, parse that image, uh, understand the features of that image, and then sort of use that data to figure out, is this a face or a not, or is it a shirt or not? So that's the sort of machine learning process uh, around it. Uh, <clears throat> And then, sort of, what uh, in terms of uh, in terms of a machine learning process is basically, you know, you will, given a problem and given a function. Now you want to sort of try out that function with different values. So you'll sort of start feeding it different kinds of images. Once with have shirt, which no shirt, with a face, no face, and the model over time will sort of learn these characteristics of different images, and it'll optimize the predictability of whether this uh, image had a face or not. And this is just sort of one example. You know, at a very high level, you have a problem, and you'll sort of build a machine learning model 
uh, to solve the problem and you'll train the model uh, with different data sets to sort of optimize the model. And the same thing you sort of do with programming as well. You write code and you'll sort of test your code with different kinds of uh, inputs to, to figure out if your code is working or not. You can use uh, machine learning for different kinds of uh, tasks, which is around the, the most common tasks around our classification, which is around classifying an object into two categories. Uh, this is a very classic example of sentiment analysis, where given a set of reviews, uh, can you classify this review as positive as being, or, or being negative? Or if you take an example of uh, issue classification, where you have a support ticket coming in, and you want to classify that support ticket based on department or area or like customer, uh, or like doing spam filtering as an example of classifying uh, uh, text. The other example is, is regression, is basically predicting uh, something. So that could be like predicting a uh, house price or like forecasting like sales are examples of tasks around regression. And then there are tasks around clustering, whereas organizing data into, into clusters which have some commonality uh, amongst them. And that could be you know, cl cluster uh, customers of this category in, in one group and clusters, uh, cluster customers of a different category in another group. So different kinds of ML tasks that are possible. Uh, and uh, sort of what we have done with ML.NET is effectively, it's a machine learning framework made for .NET developers. And what it allows you to do as a .NET developer is you can build your own custom machine learning models. And the keyword over here is, is custom based on your scenarios. It's, a, it's proven and extensible. So this is a framework that we've been using internally at Microsoft across all most of our products, for example, like Windows, uh, uh, Bing, and, and, and uh, Office where uh, we are recommending uh, sort of scenarios using ML.NET. It's uh, open source, so that means the source code is available open source. You can deploy these models anywhere. And you can consume models that were built with other frameworks. So you can load models that were built using uh, TensorFlow, for example, or, or Onyx, for example. And you can load them up in ML.NET so you can use them in your sort of .NET application as well. And it's developer focused. So what we are focusing on is what does the entire end-to-end -end life cycle look like uh, from a .NET developer perspective in terms of how do you go about building a model? So how do you write that piece of C-sharp code? Like how do you debug that code? How do you check in a model to your CI CD pipeline? So those are the semantics that we'll be looking at from a developer-focused uh, scenarios. And then yesterday, we just announced uh, ML.NET point eight, so which is now av available. And you can go to this URL to sort of try out uh, ML.NET. And the process uh, you know, of, of sort of building a machine learning model is, is a very iterative process where the first step is uh, preparing your data. And this is about accessing your data. And your data could be stored in a, in a SQL Server database, or it could be stored in a NoSQL database, or it could be stored in the cloud in terms of Azure SQL or Azure Cosmos DB, or it could be stored in, in, in flat files, which is like you know, you're ingesting a CSV file or a TSV file or a text file or you're loading images into it, uh, into the model as well. So there are different kinds of ways you can sort of upload your data. And then given a, given a problem that you want to solve, let's say if you want to do uh, issue classification, or you want to do SAP span filtering, or you want to do like product recommendations, then you can sort of build a specific model, choose a model, apply that model to that data, and get the results, and then optimize the model over time. And then you can deploy that model uh, as part of your application. So think about. A, a model that is built using ML.NET as being a class library that you can include in your application and you can deploy it uh, on-prem, on containers, on the edge, in the cloud, is just an artifact of your .NET project itself. So it sits with app local. And when you get started with machine learning, uh, from a Microsoft perspective, the, the, the first way you'll get started uh, for most of our content is around using our pre-built machine learning models with Azure Cognitive Services. And so what we have done is we have uh, trained these models for very specific scenarios around vision, speech, language. Uh, and then we have APIs that you can call uh, from your client libraries to sort of predict. So you can predict a sentiment given a, given a piece of text. But the, the limits that you will sort of reach with cognitive services or any of the pre-trained models is around, you know, 
this works great out of the box where the result was good, but it was only 96% uh, positive. And in that case, uh, this was good, but then you sort of gave it another input, which is this vacuum cleaner sucks, and the result that you got was now 9% positive. So for one input, you get 96%, for one input, sort of, you get 9%. I mean, that's just machine learning, but now the, the question for you is basically, how do you go about and, and start customizing this model so you can optimize the performance? And so for cognitive services, you know, you'll sort of reach that limit at some point in time where you know, these pre-trained models will work for you and at some cases might not work for you where you have to customize it. And then when, when you have to sort of customize and build a pre-trained and build a model, that's when ML.NET sort of comes in where you can sort of build a custom model for your custom scenario based on the data sets that you have. So you can sort of build the whole machine learning uh, uh, model yourself. The framework has been uh, used internally at Microsoft, so it's been used in Bing ads. So for for the ads prediction, uh, we use ML.NET. It's used in Excel, so when you paste a bunch of uh, data and you do chart recommendations in Excel, that's powered so by ML.NET. In PowerPoint, if you uh, sort of drop in a bunch of images or a text, it suggests you design ideas in terms of how do you want to format your slide. So that's built uh, using ML.NET as well. And then in Windows 10, Windows Defender uses it, and uh, Azure Stream Analytics uh, uses ML.NET for anomaly detection. So the, the idea over here is these models have been tested over time and they have been sort of optimized over time uh, so that they work well uh, out of the box as well. And we are sort of, uh, we are targeting these scenarios, and this is not the exhaustive list, but these are the key scenarios that we are targeting with ML.NET, which is around you can do issue classification, which will allow you to do sort of uh, uh, support ticket routing or spam filter detections or like book classifications or any sort of sort of text classification that you want to do. Like sentiment analysis would sort of let you analyze uh, text and sort of assign some sentiment uh, to it. So you can use it for reviews, you can use it for comments. We have image classification, which will we can, we can be used for detecting objects and images, or it can be used for detecting images. So in this case, uh, you can sort of load a model that was uh, trained in TensorFlow and then consume in ML.NET. We can use uh, forecasting. So you want to do uh, forecasting for your sales or you know, uh, forecasting your product inventory catalog. Uh, predictive maintenance is where, so you have uh, hardware running in, 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 in a in a factory or remote environment where you want to predict the life, lifetime of a sensor, of a hardware, you know, when, when will this sensor fail or when will this hardware fail. Recommendations are around, you have an e-commerce site and you want to do sort of product recommendations uh, for your customers or anything else. And then customer segmentation is you want to better understand how customers are sort of using your uh, product. So you can customize uh, customers into sort of different segments as well. And then, you can do a lot more as well, and this is a URL where we have uh, added all of these samples and we are adding a lot more, which, has, which will give you code to build an end-to-end -end application that will sort of give you both uh, code for training a model and code for consuming a model as well. <clears throat> and <clears throat> from a framework perspective, like this is how uh, the stack sort of looks like from a developer perspective. It will give you sort of a stack which will, which will let you write sort of training and consumption code. It comes with a set of libraries that will help you sort of do data prep. It comes with a set of libraries that have these uh, learners or algos in build. So you can just call these algorithms uh, yourself. And then it has extensions which allows you to sort of load up the entire ecosystem as well. So if you have a team which has a sort of a data science expertise in TensorFlow, then the team can build a model in TensorFlow that you can consume in, uh, in ML.NET as well. So it's a, it's a fairly open stack, and it's a fairly extensible, extensible stack uh, that you can use in your application. And then we are heavily focused on developers. So this is a screenshot of, uh, of a model training code. And I've, I've set breakpoints, and I can debug any part of the code or any part of the training process that can happen. So this is very valuable from a developer perspective to understand how the training is happening so you can customize the training based on sort of your needs and your scenario. So let's start with an example of how to build a model for doing sentiment analysis. 
at the heart of it, it starts with exploring what data do you have. In this case, I have taken up uh, data from the Wikipedia data set, which basically has uh, two columns, a comment and a, f and a flag, which says the sentiment is positive or not. And so here are the comments, uh, you know, it's all textual data, and here's the actual value to predict. So the first step in the machine learning process is figuring out what features uh, do you want to predict on? In this case, I want to read the comment and I want to predict whether the comment is going to be positive or negative. So I'm going to use comment as a features input. And the second thing that you want to pick on is what do you want to predict? So you want to predict the sentiment, which is, is it toxic or not? So those are the two categories that you want to pick like uh, in, in your data set. And then the, the model that you want to sort of apply is a classification model which is going to classify this as toxic or non-toxic, which is A or B, like one or zero. So that's the model that we'll use. Uh, so the first step is going to be around loading data, so loading that Wikipedia file, parsing it, extracting the features, which is around comment is my feature and label is what I want to predict. And the second step is going to be around uh, training a model, so we'll build a model which classifies uh, results. And then we'll evaluate the model in terms of what does the performance of the model look like. And in the end, we'll deploy the model either locally to our application or as a web service so that we can call that API and give it input and get some output back. And so that's generally the process of loading data, extracting features, building a model, and evaluating a model. Uh, <clears throat> and then how the concepts map to uh, from an ML.NET perspective are going, going to be around. I have data which I load, and I'll start building a pipeline. You can think of it as an ASP.NET pipeline that existed, where you can add transformers, which will you know, transform the data from text to uh, a vectorized text, which will be sent to my machine learning model. Uh, and then I can call the uh, estimator, which will sort of add the machine learning model. And then I can call the predict function, which is going to uh, predict the sentiment uh, of a text. So let's actually see it in action. So I'm going to load up a project which has, <clears throat> can everybody see that in the back? Is, all right. So this is a console application where I have added uh, ML.NET sort of NuGet package. In this case, uh, I have my data set over here. So this is my Wikipedia data set, which I'll open up uh, with VS code. And so the data set kind of looks like this. So the first column is the sentiment, like one or zero. The second column is the sentiment text, which has the actual text. And so I have about like, you know, some 200, 300 lines, rows of data that I load. So let me just run this app and we'll sort of uh, step through and, and, and debug the entire application as well. <laughs> So the first step in this one is, uh, so this is, uh, I've created an ML context, which is, you can think of as, as an entity framework context, like a DB context uh, that you've used. So this is a context which holds all the types that you can use for machine learning. And in this case, I'm loading uh, data from my uh, training data set, which is the file I just showed you. And I'm picking, uh, columns, which are label and text as uh, the sentiment and the actual text. And this, com this, uh, this file was a TSV file, so it's a tab separated file, so that's a separator that I'm giving it over here. And then the second step of the process is uh, picking the features. So in the slide I had, I'm gonna pick comment as my features and the label as my uh, sentiment. So in this case, I'm picking text as my features. And uh, I'm going to apply a class of uh, ML tasks called binary classification, since I want to classify this text as being the sentiment of this text being positive or negative. So I'm going to apply a binary classification ML task called fast tree, which is going to take the input, which I just created over here as, as text, and is going to uh, train a, build a model to predict whether the uh, sentiment is positive or not. And so here I'm sort of building up a pipeline where I take my input, I classify the features, then I prepare the data to be run in, to be trained into the model. And uh, 
when I call model.fit, this is the actual piece of code that's going to perform the training. So now it's, the training is happening in the background. So I have a very small data set, about 200 lines of uh, rows, 200 rows. So that's why the training sort of finished very quickly. Depending on how sort of big data sets you have, you know, the training might uh, sort of take more time. And the next step is for me to evaluate my model. So I'm going to print uh, some of the metrics that I got from the model. And so in this case, this model has about a 70% accuracy with the area under curve of 95% with an F1 score of 78%. The key metric is, you know, is basically accuracy. It's 72% because I have a very small data set. It's just 200 rows. Uh, but if you increase, if you do the full uh, Wikipedia data set, uh, and then the accuracy will sort of go up uh, as well. And then once I have trained the model, then I want to call sort of the predict function on a sample data set. And so this line is highlighting my sample data set. I just created a, a, sam a sample sentiment uh, text. And here is where I'm calling the predict function to predict the sentiment for this given text. And so I'm just going to do F10, and I can inspect what the result is going to be. So it gives me the following, where it gives me the prediction, true or false, and it gives me the probability of the prediction as well. So I can use these two variables to figure out how do I want to sort of represent this data to my end user. And so in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and print out the uh, prediction. And so this was the input text was this was a very good movie. The prediction was this is a toxic sentiment. And the probab probability was uh, about 99% of it being uh, toxic or not. And again, so this was a data, this was a model that I had trained using uh, the Wikipedia data set. And uh, the key steps of the, of the process was I loaded my data over here. Then I featureized my data. So I put, picked the features that were important to me. In this case, it was the comment. And I picked the column I wanted to predict. It was label. And then I built up a pipeline and I applied a class of ML task called binary classification because I wanted to classify the comment as being positive or negative. So there were only two values possible. And then I eventually called the, uh, the metrics function to figure out what was the performance of the metrics. And then I called the predict function on a sample data set to figure out what the prediction was going to be. And so what I'm trying to highlight over here is this prediction function is nothing but calling a C-sharp like function. So you can have this predict function anywhere in your application, and you can sort of deploy it app local uh, as well. And so I'm just going to run this uh, application and, uh, uh, and then finish this demo. Uh, questions on this? Yes. So the question is, uh, does ML.NET include all the models available in uh, Azure ML? Uh, and for folks who don't know Azure ML, it's a service that we have in Azure where you can uh, use a GUI-based interface to build models. And the answer to this is like, ML.NET has most of the commonly used models uh, available today. I don't know if there's a full feature parity between uh, Azure ML and ML.NET. We can talk offline based on sort of models that you're interested in. but. Uh, it has most of the commonly used ML tasks available. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So the question is, is this native, or does it sit on top of PyTorch, or vice versa? So this is native .NET. Uh, it's running on .NET. There is no sort of Python uh, bindings on, on this. or. Uh, we have uh, other projects where you can build a model in TensorFlow and you can load it up in ML.NET. That still runs as a .NET process. I'll show you how it works as well. Uh, and we have some experimental bindings called a Nimbus project, which is also open source, which exposes, uh, which is a Python bindings uh, that you can sort of run in the ML.NET context. So you can have cycle learn pipelines that you can run in, in .NET effectively. Yes.
So the question is, uh, is the line I highlighted, is the line where I'm evaluating the model? The, the answer is uh, the part where I'm evaluating the model, it has two parts, like what does the metrics of the model look like, which is this line, which will give me like a metrics like accuracy and each model has its own uh, metric. And the second way to evaluate the model is to call the predict function on your, on your data effectively and figure out whether the results are matching or not. Uh, and I just showed you how to call a predict function on a single row, but you can imagine that you have a SQL Server table which has like, you know, 100, 100 rows, and for each row you can call the predict function and get the output as well. Yes? Yes. So what, it, what I'll show you next in the few other examples is once you have the, once you have the trained model over here, you can save the model on disk, and then you can load that model from any .NET application. And so you can share that model amongst uh, all other applications as well. So right now, this whole example isn't in memory, but you can persist the model and load the model from disk as well. Yes? So the uh, so let me parse that question. The question is, how does the model actually work in terms of uh, classifying whether it's good or bad? Um, so what we've there are two ways to it basically. The first one is uh, it's basically a classification problem where I'm going to classify this text as one and zero, and it's going to learn based on the input I have. So my input data set sort of looks like this, where you know, some comments are positive and some are negative. And behind the scenes, when I featureize my data, it does categorization, where it's going to map some text to some vectors, and it's going to map that vectors to a positive or a negative comment. And that's how my model will train. And so that's how the model knows that given these five words, this might be positive or this might be negative. And then, then once I give my sample input, it's going to run through the same pipeline. It's going to categorize my input into vectors, and it's going to figure out, oh, for these vectors, you know, this looked like positive, so this might be positive or negative. So that's how roughly it works. Eventually, sort of, it all becomes in the, in the actual implementation of the model itself. Of, so for example, uh, FastTree might do, do something else, and SDCA might do something else. So then that goes into what model are you actually picking uh, for that. Yes? So uh, when the data was uploaded to Wikipedia, like somebody, classified, somebody basically classified the data into two columns. One was, the first column was sentiment, and the second column was sentiment text. So somebody had pre-parsed the data in, into two columns called uh, sentiment and sentiment text. They probably did it manually. They, we had, uh, there are libraries available to sort of parse the data, and then, uh, the question really depends on where, where you are in your journey as well. If you're dealing with data which is already prepped up, like your data sitting in SQL Server, then you can load it up uh, using ML.NET and sort of parse it and, so, and, and assign features and labels. But if you're dealing with a system where data is sort of raw and unstructured and you need to uh, you know, prepare it and shape it, then there are libraries available uh, both in ML.NET as well and the open source.NET ecosystem where you can start doing some sort of data prep as well to sort of shape the data in term, in, in, to sort of uh, match your business uh, goal effectively. Yes? So the question is, uh, you know, uh, there are various, various kinds of models available, like LSTM, RNN, CNNs. The, what, what sort of breadth does it have? Uh, so today, what ML.NET has is, it's, in terms of a breadth coverage, it covers our classical ML problem. So it'll have the ML tasks like classification, regression, um, anomaly detection, time series. And there's a whole list I can show you covered. It does not have deep learning today. So for deep learning like scenarios, you'll probably use like TensorFlow and build up a model in TensorFlow, export the model as a .pb file, and then load it up in ML.NET as well. Uh, yep. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, uh, step. So what I just showed you over here was how do you load your your data? Uh, how do you load your data? How do you uh, transform your data to pick your features and your labels? So in this case, we picked uh, sentiment, uh, text, and, and and sentiment. And then how do you uh, transform the data to convert from text to a vectorized format, which you can give to a model. And then how do you call the predict function on your sample data to get a prediction out of it or not? In the next example, uh, I'm just going to show you different kinds of ML tasks that you can do uh, with ML.NET as well. So the first task was binary classification. The second one is a multi-class classification, which is GitHub issue classification or spam filtering or like document classification or, or issue classification in the support center. And this is what we actually use it today. If you go to the .NET Core, .NET repos, and you open a new issue, uh, we automatically classify the issue into one of these labels because it's a big open source project. Developers don't know what different labels are there and stuff. But from our perspective, you want to auto classify all these issues into areas so it's easier for us to triage. And uh, so I'm going to show you how to build this model in ML.NET. This is the exact same model that we run in our site uh, so for each and every issue. And so the problem over here is, given an issue which has a title and a description, I want to classify the label of this particular issue. So in my case, my inputs are going to be my title and my description. And the output is going to be the label in which this issue is going to be classified into. So. Uh, so let's see uh, what, what the model is going to look like. The, in this case, the, the data set I have is around, uh, it's a TSV file. So, so what I've done over here is basically, I, you know, I went to GitHub, I downloaded all the issues that existed in the core FX repo, and basically it has four columns. First is the ID, what's the ID of the issue. Second is the area. This is my training data set. And so what was this bug classified into? Third one is my title, which is what's the title of the bug. And the fourth column is description. What is the description of the bug? So I have this is my training data. And so what I'm going to do in my uh, sample is I'm going to load up this uh, project, and I'm going to run it. And we'll just debug as well. <clears throat> And we'll just walk through the steps here. So the first step is uh, I'm going to create a new ML context. Let me minimize this. And the second step is I'm going to load up my data, and I'm going to pick the columns I want. So I want ID, I want area, I want title, I want description. And then I'm going to specify my training data set. It's the TSV file I just showed you. And then I'm going to start sort of uh, featurizing my data. And what I'm doing over here is basically I'm going to convert from strings to vectors. So in this case, I'm going to map area from being area hyphen system web. I'm going to assign it a number so I can map it. So these are my labeling. I'm going to featureize title and description, which is going to convert it from being text to being vectors, which is what the model is going to exp uh, expect. Then I'm going to concatenate. Uh, title and description into a single column, because the model, the way it works is there's one input and there's one output. So the input is a, feat, is a vector of all your features, and the output is just your labels. So that's why I'm concatenating uh, title and description. And in this case, I picked a, a type of classification problem called multi-classification, which is different from sentiment analysis, which was binary. And I'm going to use a model called SDCA. It's a very popular model. And then the last step is when I get the prediction, I want to get the actual label back. Instead of getting like number one, two, I want to get like system web or system.net, the actual label I predicted. Yes? The, uh, the question is what kind of features am I extracting? Right now, uh, the, I've already picked the features like title and description, but I'm uh, categorizing them into vectors. So I'm. 
So we run a, a, a vectorizer called Ngram, which does one heart encoding across your entire sort of uh, uh, features of, uh, effectively. And you can customize the Ngram, or you can use Ngram hash uh, to, uh, as well. Uh, and so once I've sort of done my, uh, I've built up my pipeline, I'm going to call the dot fit function on this uh, pipeline I built, which is going to give me a trained model. Again, it's going to train locally. Uh, my data set is small, so the training will happen uh, fairly quickly over here. And then once I finish, I'm going to sort of create a dummy issue over here. And then I'll call the predict, uh, I'll sort of make the predict function. And I'll call the predict uh, function on this uh, sample data set, and I'll got my classified label back over here, which I'll just output. Uh, so I'll, you'll see the result was uh, area system net. And so this was just one issue, and you can run this sample on uh, sort of all my issues as well. And in the end, in this case, I'm going to save the model on disk so I can load the model uh, in a different program as well uh, effectively. And then I'll run through my sample again. The, the last thing I'll do is uh, I'm going to actually use it for, for a real uh, problem. So in this case, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm getting all the issues from the uh, .NET machine learning repo. So, so these are all the issues that exist. And here I am, if I go over all issues, so basically I got the issues from the last 10 days or something. So these are the actual issues that were opened up. You know, this is uh, uh, created ad, title, description, ID. And then I'm going to sort of, uh, you know, iterate over all these uh, values and I'm gonna call the predict function for each one of them uh, as well. And then I'm gonna output that result. So here's, it's calling the predict function for uh, each of the issues. And the idea over here was to show that you can start calling this as an API, uh, and your data could be anywhere. It could be like in, on the web, it could be in, in database. And uh, what we do is basically we run this piece of code of the predict function as an Azure function. So it can be called each time a new issue is, new issue is called. It's serverless, so it's not running all the time. And the predict function gets called when the new issue is opened up. Uh, so we can just run through the whole uh, application as well. I think it'll take some time. Yeah. So it outputted, uh, you know, all the issues it sort of classified. So the idea over here was basically, you know, in terms of the machine learning sort of process, the steps are very similar to what you saw in sentiment analysis, where you create an ML context. So you load your data. You pick your columns that you want, um, and then you start sort of uh, picking the features that you want and the labels that you want. In this case, I want title and description as my features, and I concatenate the two columns. And I pick label as the column I want to predict so in terms of what's the area this bug is going to belong to. I'm going to pick up uh, the problem I'm trying to solve, since this, going to, this is going to be a multi-classification in, instead of binary classification. I can use one of these uh, and, and sort of other uh, trainers as well. And I call the fit function, which is going to give me a trained model. Uh, and then I can call a predict function on a sample data, which I can replace with my real data as well. And I can save the model optionally, and I can load this model from any of my clients as well. So that's how you would do sort of uh, uh, multi-classification in, in, in uh, ML.NET. Yes? Is it outside of the scope of ML.NET when you uh, deal with uh, taking 70% of your data for training and the, the other 30% for uh, testing what you just trained it on? Is that outside of uh, the, you know, the text readers in there or setting a random seed for random record seed? So that's a, that's a perfect question. Uh, so the question, I guess, is more around uh, there, are, there are a few best practices that we sort of follow from a machine learning process is around uh, the first is uh, seeding, which is around you want to make sure that your results are consistent. So here we take in a seed, you know, a random value, which will ensure that each time you run the model, you'll get the same results. 
if you don't specify a seed, then each time you run the model, you might get different results because initial seeding is, is random. So that's sort of one example. The second example, second sort of question was, what I showed you over here was, I was, uh, since this is just a demo, I was just uh, training on my, you know, my training data set. Uh, but the question was, let's say you have a data set, then what are the different ways you can train the model? And there are different ways available where you can split the data as an 80-20. So 80% goes to training and 20% goes to testing. Or you can do cross-validation where it does random folds across your data set. Uh, and the few other best practices uh, that we also follow is once you have trained the model, then you would want to test your model against your entire testing data set as well, not just like 10%, 20%. And you want to make sure that your model doesn't sort of overfit and stuff. So yes, so all those APIs are available for you to sort of try it out if you, if you sort of know uh, the intrinsics of, of the machine learning process. Uh, more questions? <laughs> Does, is, is this uh, sort of making sense, the speed and the content? OK. So I'm going to show you another example. Uh, of a scenario, which is a different kind of scenario around uh, uh, recommendation. So th in this example, I'm going to show you how to build a model that does movie recommendation, so kind of like Netflix style. But the idea is that you can sort of take this and build a recommendation for recommending products to customers as well and using the same concept. And so from a recommendation perspective, there are basically three approaches that exist in general. Uh, the first approach says that, you know, recommend me the most popular movies. So in this case, you know, we have taken this data set from IMDb, which says, here are the top 10 movies. And I, as a, as a developer, can build a model that's going to sort of give users the top 10 movies all the time. But that's not interesting, because that's a static. The second is called content-based filtering, which is around, uh, based on my historical uh, interaction, recommend me, recommend me something. So in this case, maybe historically I have sort of, uh, uh, we have seen a lot of these movie genres, so let me recommend movies of the same genre. So in this case, you know, I liked Iron Man, and so maybe recommend me movies which are from genre called superheroes uh, and so forth. Again, it's very restrictive because it's still sort of based on, uh, again, what I was doing, not what anybody else was doing. The third approach, which is what we look at, is called collaborative filtering. And the, the essence of collaborative filtering is around uh, if I do something and me and somebody else have the same preferences, then if I like something, then the likelihood of the other person like, liking it, it is the same. So like if I go you know, and I, I have a certain persona and I, I go buy a jeans on a, on a store, there's some other user which has the same persona, and the, then now you can recommend them jeans because they have similar characteristics. So that's called collaborative filtering. And so in this uh, demo, what we'll see is I have three users, like you know, Ankit, Amy, and Caesar, And uh, you know, each one of them has watched some different kinds of movies where Ankit doesn't like you know, Heat, Mission Impossible, Home Alone. Uh, and then he doesn't like Casino Royale. Amy uh, sort of likes uh, Heat, Mission Impossible, Home Alone, Terminator, and will predict whether she likes uh, Casino Royale or not. Uh, Caesar here likes uh, Heat and Mission Impossible and doesn't like Home Alone. I don't know why. Everybody should like Home Alone. But uh, likes Terminator 2 and Casino Royale. So uh, the idea is you have three users who have certain characteristics. And sort of how do you build a collaborative filter model to recommend a movie for Amy? Uh, the data set that we're using over here is a movie lens database. It has uh, two files, like a ratings file and a movies file. Ratings file basically has user ID, movie ID, and a rating. Uh, and imagine so I'm, I'm going in this site and liking movies that I like. So that's a rating that I've been given at this timestamp. And then there's a whole movies uh, table which has the details of the movies, the title, the genre, so I can sort of do more uh, interesting lookups uh, for that uh, site. And so in this case, my features are going to be my user ID and my movie ID, uh, and then what I'm going to predict is the rating on a scale of 1 to 5 or 1 to 10, uh, the likelihood of me sort of liking this movie. And so the way the model is going to be built up is I'm going to pick user. I'm going to input my data, which is my CSV file. I'm going to featureize it, where I'll pick user ID and movie ID as my features. And I'll predict 
the likelihood of me sort of liking a movie or not as the, as the rating I want to predict. And so I'll build a model on, on that, and I'll train the model, and I'll try out the model on, on some sample data sets uh, by calling the predict function. Uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, see how this model sort of works out uh, as well. And so my data set in this case is uh, a CSV file. So this is ratings. So it's basically user, user ID, movie ID, rating, timestamp, uh, and then I have a testing and a training data set. Uh, so in this case, I've already split the data set into testing and training, but you could do it uh, in line as well. And uh, in this scenario, uh, I have two solutions over here. Uh, here is a solution where I have built a model. So I'll just walk you through this code, and I'll show you it running in a web application. So I'm going to call this model from a web app. And so the first step in this process was you know, creating the machine learning context, loading the data, picking out the columns I want. So in this case, I wanted user ID, movie ID, and the, and the label. And then I sort of load my training and testing data sets. And uh, then I sort of build my pipeline, which is going to featureize the data, and it's going to add a machine learning model as well. Uh, so I do a categorical transform on, uh, on this data set. And then I concatenate user ID and movie ID into a single column, because machine learning models take one input and one output, and give one output. And then in this case, I'm going to pick this trainer called field aware factorization machine, which is one of the most popular models to use for uh, recommendation as well. Uh, <clears throat> Amazon released one of their recommendation services at reInvent, which uses the same model. Uh, and then I'm going to call model pipeline.fit, which is going to train the model using my training data set, and it's going to give me a model. And then I'm going to evaluate the model. Uh, try out the model, and then I'm going to save the model on disk. So this is the model I load up in my web application. And so let's go to my web app, and let's uh, run this as well. So this is uh, the web application is nothing but an ASP.NET application. Uh, and the idea over here is to show you how you can sort of load your model uh, in a web app as well. And so in this case, uh, what you'll see on the screen is basically uh, a web app. It's, uh, it has three users, uh, Cesar, Amy, and uh, Ankit. If this comes up. OK. And so I'll show you what Ankit's profile looks like. You know, Ankit has watched uh, sort of these six movies. And uh, these are the all-time box movies. So this is the first kind of recommendation that you can have, like show me the most popular movies irrespective of what I've watched. And uh, in this case, uh, you know, this is basically what the, the model has recommended. And if I switch profile and if I go to Amy, you know, she's, like, she's sort of watched different kind of movies which are in different genres. But she gets the same list of the all-time box office movies because it's a static list for every user. Uh, so you know that's why it's not so interesting. So if I go to Ankit and I hit recommend, this is going to actually load up my machine learning model for recommendation, pass in the profile of Ankit, and it's going to recommend. It's going to give me the like. What's the likelihood of Ankit liking all these uh, movies effectively? So if I click recommend, this is basically nothing but an MVC controller where I have load up, loaded up the model and. Uh, you know, the same process where I create the ML context. In this case, this code loads the model that was stored on disk effectively. And so this model gets loaded. And then, you know, the same process I make called the predict function. Uh, and this code is just code to sort of consume the ratings so that I have a user and I have the ratings and the likelihood of the user uh, sort of uh, liking each rating or not. So it's just a data structure to store the results. Uh, the crux of it effectively comes when, when I call the predict function. So in this case, uh, I'm iterating over all the popular movies uh, that were there. And I'm going to call the predict function and then figure out 
what the prediction was going to look like. Uh, so in this case, it's giving me a score of uh, whether I like that movie or not. And I'm just going to normalize the score on a scale of 1 to 100, so it's consistent across all the users. So it's giving me a 42% uh, probability that I like this movie or not. And I'm going to add all the uh, ratings to my uh, local data store. And then when I run the app, then you'll see that there's a percentage over here across each of these movies on what's the likelihood of sort of me liking this movie. So there's a 65% you know, chance that I might like Casino Royale or 42% chance for Face Off. But if I switch profiles and go for Amy, and then I click the recommend bet button again, it goes to the same set of code where it's gonna call the predict function for all the top uh, movies. And it's gonna give me a rating of what's the likelihood of uh, Amy liking the rating or not. And again, the, the numbers by themselves are not sort of so interesting, but the idea over here is like, recommendation is a very interesting scenario where uh, as a developer, you wanna be careful in terms of what you wanna show to your users because uh, what this model is telling you is basically based on the historical data and based on uh, people who have a similar profile, you know, that's what they have liked, here is the likelihood of this person liking these movies, you know, and you give a percentage. Uh, and then you, you'll have to figure out how to present that information to the user. Like Netflix give you, here's a list of other movies that you might like, and gives you a score of this likelihood of you liking the movie or not. So it's a very soft introduction into clicking that recommendation link. Uh, but the data is over here, sort of for you to consume uh, in, in terms of the machine learning model to build. And the, and the process is very similar where you, 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 you load your data, in this case, your data could be stored in two SQL Server tables as well. Like one has products, one has catalog, and one has users, and one has orders. And so you can combine all those data as well in memory, uh, and you can feed it to this pipeline, you can categorize it, uh, and then you can get the result. And then you can call the predict function for each and every row of your uh, table, and then sort of sh figure out uh, how do you want to show this uh, probability of this user sort of liking it uh, you know, X and Y or not. Uh, <clears throat> yes? So the question is, uh, are, are these sort of uh, models uh, trained uh, statically or can I sort of, uh, uh, sort of add the delta of the data I trained on, then it only trains on the delta and sort of, sort of augments itself? The, the answer to that is uh, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be sort of a retrain of the model as well based on the data that you augment with. Because it depends on the data that you're augmenting. It might sort of increase or sort of decrease the performance and you have to sort of retrain the model. What you can do is you can seed the data with, some, uh, with a random seed that you can have, which is gonna give you pre predictable results uh, as you train this model. And so you'll, you'll get uh, the same result if you have the same seed effectively. And so, you can have, maybe you can have different seeds for different sort of data sets and figure out the performance of the model and then, uh, and then figure out if that's the data set you wanna take or not. Because the thing you don't wanna do is, you don't want to sort of augment your training data with new data set and have the model accuracy regress and then recommend the wrong you know, item or product or something to the user. So there is, there's some sort of management that has to be done. So let's talk about your specific use case like offline uh, in terms of how can you go about sort of managing. Uh, let's, let's, let's do that after the talk. Um, mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes. Would it skew the results of the trained model if the data had outliers in it? Like 
a particular user only answered, only responded negatively. They, ne they never responded positively to anything. And is there, does this mitigate that? I mean, that sort of thing. Um, yes, skewness can happen. Like if it's biased towards a certain like user or the activity of the user, or it could be biased towards there's like there's a lot of like null values that can exist. Uh, so as part of your uh, sort of machine learning process, what you also want to do, especially in the in the data exploration space, is to figure out if your data has skewness or has bias or not. And so when you load your data you can sort of do basic explorations on to detect like are there like is, is the data skewed in, in some sort of factor is there like one user like having 90% of the reviews and then so on but that's an exploration that you have to do to sort of explore your data okay. and it depends on what the state of the, your data is if your data is already like prepped up in a SQL server database you know that's where your bi reporting is running from the likelihood of having its skewness is probably less versus you working on sort of raw data sets where the likelihood of skewness being high is, you know, is, is, is high, basically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, if I were to paraphrase the question, the question is, you know, once you have sort of uh, trained your model over here, uh, and you want to score the model, uh, what what are the sort of best practices? Can you cache the model, or do you have to load the model from disk every time? Like, and so the answer to that is basically, once you have trained the model, then you can load it once in memory, and it caches, and uh, it's you can you can store it in you know ASP.NET. You can inject it in any of your controllers. You can load a single instance of the model for your whole app, or you can load multiple instances of the model. And it also depends where your model is running in. Like in this case, I showed you the model running as part of the website. Uh, but let's say if you're doing a anomaly detection or prediction where the model is actually running on the edge, there you might have to have different semantics in terms of you want the model to be very light and, and, and sort of very um, fast in terms of response times. And uh, so you, your model might be sort of smaller. Uh, here, depending on the scenario, again, you know, your response times might, might, might vary. Uh, but the short answer is basically it's, uh, the model can be cached. This whole pipeline can be cached as well. And you can load a single instance of the model. You can inject your model into your, as a DI. Uh, you, can, you can use DI to sort of inject your model. You can use singleton, uh, and so on and so forth. Yes? Uh, so the question is like, how big does a training model get on disk? I mean, it depends. Uh, I, I sorry, I don't have a good answer in terms of how big. But uh, what's the question that you really want to ask? So the output generally is basically the model is nothing but a binary format. It's a binary format, so the zip file that you get, and these are fairly small. Uh, yep. Yeah. Inputs and outputs is, yeah, effectively. OK, any more questions before I move on? OK. Uh, so I showed you uh, sort of uh, recommendations. The, the next scenario is basically around deep learning. So so far, what I've shown you are scenarios around what can be labeled as like classical ML uh, scenarios. Uh, deep learning is about. Uh, scenarios uh, sort of uh, around image classification or object detection and stuff. And so here is an example of, uh, of, of, de of a deep learning scenario where you know, the classical example is I want to classify whether an object is, is a cat or a dog or does it have its feature or not. And then uh, you want to sort of build a model uh, for it. Uh, from an ML.NET perspective, uh, again, the, the, the position that we have over here is a, it's a framework for .NET developers to build models. And right now, we've enabled classical ML like scenarios and models. We also want to leverage what the ecosystem is very good at. And TensorFlow sort of is a big popular library for building deep learning models. And so uh, what you can do in ML.NET is you can 
consume a model that was built in TensorFlow, which is good for deep learning, and you can use it for scoring. So you can call this TensorFlow model in your doctrine application and classify an image as being a cat or a dog or not. And beyond TensorFlow, what uh, ML.NET also supports is uh, an open source format called Onyx. So this is an open source format which is sort of built in consortium with uh, Microsoft and, and Facebook and other companies where you can export the model in an Onyx format and consume in any other framework uh, as well. And uh, so the steps for building a, uh, consuming a deep learning model in, in, in NML.NET kind of something very similar, where your first step is you want to lo load your data. In this case, it'll be uh, images that you're loading up, and you want to figure out what you want to classify, which will be your label, where you classify as cat versus dogs. And then you'll build a pipeline where you'll process your data, and then you'll add a TensorFlow model as part of your pipeline. And then you'll build the pipeline, you'll uh, call the uh, model, and then you can call the predict function where you can call in each and every image and you can classify the image as being uh, the label that you wanted to predict or not. Uh, so let's look at an example of uh, image classification with uh, ML.NET as well. So in this case, uh, What I have over here is uh, this is a this is a program where I'm going to load up a TensorFlow model. So let me show you the data set first. In this case, I have these images, uh, which is like broccoli. Uh, you know, there are vegetables. There's coffee pot. There's pizza. Uh, there is uh, Teddy, and then I'm going to classify these uh, images into one of the following. So let me show you uh, that data set. Tags.tsv. And so basically what it has is it has, it has a mapping of uh, classifying these images uh, as, uh, as what they are. And uh, I'm going to sort of use a TensorFlow model to predict what these images are and see what the accuracy of this prediction is going to look like. So these are the images that I have. Uh, let's run through our sample. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so, yep, yep, perfect. So here, basically, uh, what I'm doing over here is uh, the steps are very similar. So I load up my data. Uh, in this case, I'm just loading up uh, what's the image path where all my files are, uh, my, Im my image files are. And then this is my uh, location of the data set. And now sort of I'm trying to featureize my text. And instead of doing sort of text featureization, I am uh, calling uh, load images, which is going to load images from this image folder. and. Uh, then I'm going to sort of uh, uh, call some resizing and extracting pixels uh, from, from this function. And then I'm going to call the TensorFlow estimator, which is basically going to add this uh, pre-trained TensorFlow model uh, that I have in my application. So you can build a model in TensorFlow, and you can export a model in TensorFlow, which is going to be exported as a .pb file, which then you can then load up in your uh, sort of ml.net uh, project. And uh, so you call pipeline.fit, and then you call your uh, predict function uh, over here. So let's do, and so in this case, now it's gonna read all the labels, and then for each sample, it's gonna 
figure out the probability of uh, what is the probability that this image is uh, of you know label zero to label fourteen? Again, in deep learning, sort of you don't get a accuracy score. Like you get a prediction for each uh, column or each label that you want to predict, and uh, then you can sort of figure out which. Uh, how do you want to classify your image? In this case, I am basically, you know, re reading that image. I'm getting probabilities of. Uh, that this image could be a, a broccoli or a canoe or a coffee. And then I'm picking the label which has the maximum probability and I'm just displaying that basically. So in this case, I picked broccoli because it had the maximum probability from a, a output perspective. But if I sort of run through all my scenarios, so you will see that you know, I had these 13, 14 samples and the green ones were the ones it correctly predicted and the red ones are the ones that it sort of incorrectly uh, predicted. Uh, but the idea over here is like, uh, so you can sort of load a pre-trained uh, TensorFlow model, and then you can call it from ML.net, and then you can uh, uh, sort of use it to classify images and stuff. And sort of TensorFlow has a fairly sort of extensive ecosystem around what kind of deep learning scenarios can you build. So it's around images classification, around like OCR, object detection, and so you can sort of use all of those and use them to score in your uh, ML.NET uh, application, in your, in your .NET application effectively. Any questions? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so we covered that. And so what I showed you here today was uh, the green ones are the examples that I showed you today that you can sort of do with ML.NET. Uh, there's a lot more that you can do uh, with forecasting, uh, predictive maintenance, object detection. And in this, on this URL, uh, we basically have created a GitHub repo where we have all our samples. And uh, so if I go to this uh, GitHub repo, uh, what we have is basically we have you know, samples for sentiment analysis, spam detection, fraud detection, and we've classified them by the ML task. And then we go into sort of best practices of how do you do seeding, how do you deploy the model, how do you do split the data between training and testing, how do you do cross-validation, how do you understand the model performance? And so you can start sort of going through all of these samples. Uh, all of them have code, effectively, that you can consume as a console app, or a web app as well. So I strongly encourage you to sort of try out uh, this uh, GitHub project. And then, uh, you know, it's a journey that started at build of this year. In May, we released point one. And ye uh, yesterday, we just released point eight, where we added support for more debugging, uh, model explainability to figure out what features are important of all, you know, have 10 features, which features to use. Why did the model give you 70% versus 80%? So those kind of sort of debugging capabilities we've added. And the best part is like you can set a breakpoint in, in sort of VS and sort of start exploring this model explainability concepts as well. So you don't have to sort of write some other UI for it. Uh, and then what we're sort of working on next, uh, going forward you know, towards 1.0 and beyond is uh, we want to sort of keep improving our APIs. Uh, we want to sort of add more machine learning tasks, or you know, if you feel there are sort of models and algos that are missing, we can add it. We want to imp improve uh, deep learning. We want to improve uh, scale out and sort of deployment with the Azure AML. We are building sort of a GUI-based interface where you can you know, start with a scenario in mind, and you can use a visual interface to sort of build a model which will, at the end of the process, give you a code for model training and model consumption. So the code that I showed you for model training is a code that you'll get as the output of this tool. And uh, uh, we'll, you know, we are innovating from a language perspective in .NET and in both in C-sharp to add new language types, like we added span. Uh, we are adding support for better sort of data prep, like scenarios, so you can explore your data and like, detect like skewness, for example, in your data set uh, much more efficiently. Uh, so again, you know, uh, these are the links. I strongly encourage you to sort of capture this as well. Uh, these are places where you can get started with, with, uh, with ML.NET. Uh, we have samples. We have documentation, end-to-end uh, -end tutorials. And if you have any feature requests or you want to contribute, we're open source. Uh, and, and, and you can sort of reach out to us as well. 
So again, thank you very much for, uh, for attending this talk. I hope this was uh, useful. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here to sort of answer uh, your questions. And you know, again, thank you very much.